Hey, and welcome back. My name is Daniel Caproni, and I teach AP Statistics for Western Hills University High School. In the last few videos, we have been talking about confidence intervals and how to create them, in particular for one proportion confidence intervals. Today, we're going to continue that discussion and look at three major things. Number one, we're going to check out a discussion on critical values. We haven't really discussed critical values because up to this point, we've only been dealing with 95% confidence intervals. But there's actually a whole bunch of confidence intervals you can do, and they involve finding something called the critical value, which we're going to look at today. After we do that, we're going to go ahead and find some real life situations and find confidence intervals for those. After that, I'm going to show you guys how to find some of our upper and lower bounds by using a calculator to do it instead of doing it by hand. So I hope this information is going to be useful. And remember, if you're ever feeling lost or behind, you can find all of my videos on YouTube by searching Mr. Caproni. You'll find my entire AP list there, so if you just go through, you can start from day one. But at this point, we're going to be continuing with day 15 of AP Statistics. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you learned something new. Now remember, we've been talking a whole bunch about confidence intervals, but what are they? It's just when we're taking information about a sample and using it to kind of make a prediction about the whole population. For example, if I looked at 500 seniors in America and found out that... I don't know, 60% of them have a part-time job while they're students in high school, then we would assume that all of America would probably have between 55 to 65% of their seniors have a part-time job during high school. Now, we don't say exactly 60% because it's very unlikely that it would be exactly the same as our sample. But if our sample is large enough, it gives us a really reasonable guess for what it would be for the whole population. Now, we've been dealing with this whole 95% confidence uh, for all the problems we've done in the past, but that's not the only percent you could use. You can also use 90% and you use 99%. Those two are extremely common. And in reality, you can use any percent because we can find out now how you go about making this percent. Now, the way that we find out how you would figure out the exact percent of confidence is actually by breaking down the whole formula per se for our confidence interval. Remember, our confidence interval is made up by doing p hat plus or minus the margin of error. But that margin of error is just this number times our standard error. Now, if we're looking at this formula as a whole, there's certain things about it that won't change. For example, p hat is the proportion of success from our sample. That's not going to change. The standard error is just the square root of our probability of success from the sample, known as p hat, times our probability of failure from the sample, known as q hat, divided by our sample size when we're doing this. So that's going to give us a standard error every time. Again, not really any wiggle room. That's going to be the same formula. What we haven't really had an answer to is where this 2 came from. And that number right there is actually called our critical point. Now, as a critical point, it is what decides the percent of confidence. Now, we've been using two because of our discussion of the normal curve. And we said, hey, if we're looking at this normal curve down here, if you go two standard deviations in either direction, we know that by the empirical rule, about 95% of the population falls in between those two. And that's where we kind of got this two equals 95% thing. Now, the way that we can get different percents is by changing that two. Now, how do we go about changing that number to give us the percent we actually want? Well, the best way to go about doing this is going to be looking back at how we truly got that 95% out of the two. So where did that two come from? If you remember, when we were discussing the normal curve, we said that your mean goes in the middle here, you go up or down by whatever your standard deviation is, all right? And we found out that as you shade certain areas underneath here, so let's say we wanna go from here to here, we found out that if you shade in this area, okay, that that actually represents the percent of the population that would fall between that number and that number in terms of the data you're looking at. 
And we found out that somehow, if you go that far in either direction and shade in that area, it ends up being 95%. But is there a way for us to find out exactly what it is? Yes, there is. It's the inverse norm function in our calculator, all right? So let's go ahead and find out, using the inverse norm function in the calculator, exactly what number in either direction will give us the 95% that we want. In order to do that, we first need to remember what will we plug into the inverse norm. Well, let's take a look-see at what inverse norm is going to ask. If you didn't know, we're using the TI Inspire right now. Uh, you can also do this on a TI 8384, but we've been using a TI Inspire throughout my class, so that's what I want to stick with. If you pull up this menu and go to probability or statistics and then go to distributions, you will find the inverse norm in your menu setting. So when we click on inverse norm, it asks for an area, a mean, and a standard deviation. We're dealing with the standard normal curves. We'll actually leave zero and one as our mean and standard deviation. But what would be the area? Remember, our calculator always calculates the area under the curve. So when it says area, what it's talking about is this guy, what it wants shaded. It always shades from negative infinity up to whatever we want to put in. Now, there's no easy way for us right now to say we want the middle 95%. So instead of saying the middle 95%, we say, okay, well, if we want the middle 95%, let's find out what number would be the cutoff right here. And because it's symmetrical, this will be the negative version and this will be the positive version of that number. And if we know what percent to put in right here, then it should give us the negative and positive number that we need for an exact 95% confidence. So how much is left over on the two sides? Well, if we have 95% in the middle, how much is left over? 5%. But we can't say 5% because that is split with the left and right hand side. So instead of saying 5%, we say, okay, well then how much is on each side? Well, we can just divide that 0.05 by two to give us 0 0.025 on each side. So now we have 95% in the middle, we have 0 0.025 over here on the left and 0 0.025 or 2.5% over here on the right, and all together we have our 100%. Now what does this mean for us? It means that when we're doing the inverse norm function in the calculator, we want to make sure to plug in our 0 0.025 for the area, because what's that going to give us? It's going to tell us the number that is going to cut off right here to give us the middle 95%. So then we'll use that number as the negative and the positive to kind of give us that critical value of how far we should go in either direction for our problem. Now, let's go ahead and hit enter and see what we get. It says here that it is 1.95996. In other words, 1.96. Now this may be mind blowing because over and over again, what have we said? We have said that two standard deviations in either direction will give you 95% in the middle. But in reality, it's actually 1.96 standard deviations in either direction will give you exactly the 95% in the middle. And the two was just an estimate we've been using all this time. You mean to tell me you've been adding a 0.04 this whole time and you didn't even tell us? You just, just been throwing it in there like it was nothing? What do you have to say for yourself? So, when we're looking at this, this 1.96, what we have been using as 2, is actually going to be called our critical value. And the critical value is represented as a Z star. That's kind of the symbol we use for critical value. Now, I know I mentioned it as the critical point earlier, and I said critical value now. All same, different textbooks use different things. But uh, this is our critical value, I believe, is going to be the definition your book will use. That's the one we're going to stick with for the rest of this video. So 1.96 is this fancy 
number right here. So we've been using two, but in reality, we probably should have been putting in 1.96 this whole time to get exactly what we need. So then in that case, how would we go about doing the same question for 90% or 95%? Well, you would actually go through the whole same process. When we're looking at the normal curve, all right, you would wanna go ahead and find out if 90% is in the middle, what's left over, what well, turns out that 10% is left over. So we would do inverse norm in the calculator to find out, but remember we can't put in 10%, so we have half on each side. So we'd put 0 0.05 over here and 0 0.05 over here. And in our calculator, we would end up going ahead and plugging in again, menu, inverse probability, we wanna to go to distribution, inverse norm, and we put in our 0.05, remember that's 5%, don't put 0.5 because that's 50%. We hit okay and you can see here it's negative 1.64485. So if you round it up uh, three decimal places, it's negative 1.645. And if you go back to this, what do they have here? They say that the critical value is 1.645. So that's where that number is coming from. That means if we wanted to do a 90% confidence interval, we would just do p hat plus or minus 1.645 times our standard error, which remember is just the square root of p hat times q hat divided by n. So this is how you end up changing that percent level of confidence. You say, what percent do you want for your level of confidence? So say 90 in this case, you plug that in the middle, you find out what is left over on the outsides, do an inverse norm in the calculator to find out what number that would give you. And that number right there is our critical value, which you just plug right here into the formula. And that will change us from a 95% confidence to a 90% confidence. But this time, really, if you get a chance, go ahead and try to do this for yourself for 99%. In about five seconds, I wanna go ahead and give you the answer to that, and maybe you should write it down, but you wanna make sure you try that on your own as well, so you're not just going off of what I'm doing right now on the screen. So if I were to go ahead and try to give a one pager on all the information we've covered about confidence interval intervals so far, this is what I'd come up with. It says, when the conditions are met, we are ready to find the confidence interval for a population proportion P. The confidence interval itself would be P hat, that's the sample proportion, times the critical value, that's R as Z star, and we just talked about how to go about finding that, times your standard error, where the standard error is just your p hat times q hat divided by n, take the square root of the whole thing. Now, I've also included on here the three most common level of confidences you can have would be 90%, 95%, and 99%. The critical values that go with them are 1.645, which we found together, 1.96, which we found together, and I told you guys to go ahead and try finding the 99% one on your own, but it turns out being 2.575. Um, that, that is actually an odd rounding because your calculator is going to kind of give you like a 2.576 if you round properly. But if you go back to the old school charts, they actually rounded to 2.575. So you should end up right there in that ballpark. Um, and don't forget the critical value Z star depends on the particular confidence level C that you specify for the actual question itself, all right? So let's go ahead and dive right in and try to do a word problem type question where we just come up with the confidence interval, talk about what it means all the way through. It says here uh, that in April 2011, a Yale George Mason poll of 1,010 U.S. adults found that 40% of respondents believe that scientists disagree about whether global warming exists. They reported a 95% confidence interval with a margin of error of 3%. Using the critical value of Z and the standard error based on the observed proportion, what would be the margin of error for a 90% confidence interval? 
what's good and bad about this change. Now, what is it talking about a change? If you've watched my previous videos, you'll see that this is actually the same question we used for the worst case scenario in the last video that I did. So if you don't know what that's talking about, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect how we are doing this question. So it wants us to use a critical value um, and find what 90% confidence interval and it wants to know what's good or bad. So first off, what did we say the critical value was for 90%? We said that we would be using 1.645. So um, I go in here just to keep in mind, what does that mean? It means that we use the 1.645 for that one, all right? And I've kind of went about and put a bunch of this information down for us. So end of the day, what do we need? We need to find standard error, all right? We need to multiply that by our critical value. Uh, we need to add and subtract that from our P hat, and that's gonna give us our actual confidence interval. So for the first step here, let's go ahead and find that standard error. Um, it says here, we, we noticed that N is gonna be 1,010. P hat in this case was at 40%, so put it in as 0 0.40. So when we plug that into our formula for standard error, we get the square root of 0 0.40 times 0 0.60 divided by 1,010, and that gives us 0 0.0154. So that 0 0.0154 is our standard error, all right? So now how do we plug that in? For our 90% confidence level, Z star, as we see that we already wrote down here, we would use a critical value of 1.645. So when we do the margin of error, which is what we're going to be adding and subtracting from our P hat, we would do the 1.645, the critical value, and multiply that by 0 0.0154, which is the answer we got right above when we were finding the standard error. That answer for the full margin of error when you multiply the two of those together is 0 0.0254, which is what we're going to be adding and subtracting from our P hat in order to get our final confidence interval. So the next step would be to go ahead and add and subtract that margin of error from our P hat. So, and you should have little hats above them, but my computer doesn't do those very well. So P hat minus the margin of error, um, of 0 0.0254 would give us 0.3746, and p hat plus that margin of error would give us 0.4254. So at the end of the day, what does this mean in terms of a confidence interval? Well, here are our major two numbers that we're dealing with here, all right? So when we are talking confidence interval, we would be able to say uh, something along the lines of, with a 90% confidence, we believe that somewhere between 37.46% and 42.54% of adults believe scientists disagree about this. So at the end of the day, this would be the full answer confidence interval, the whole shebang for a question like this. We went through, we did all the logistics, we did all the work, we found our two numbers, I converted them to percents because it's a little bit better to understand there. Remember the original question was saying that they got a confidence interval for all respondents of what they believe uh, if scientists disagree about global warming or not. And so we would say that if they went out and they asked all US adults out there, all of them, they would find that somewhere between 37.46% of them and 42.54% of them would think that scientists disagree about the whole global warming thing. And they can say that with 90% confidence. Now that's a little bit different than the 95 before, because what that's gonna say is that the actual like window there, the 37 to 42 is gonna be smaller. So we're much more exact and precise in our answer, but we do have a little less confidence, which means that our true proportion is going to be in that interval less often than when we were dealing with the 95% which isn't the end of the world. In all honesty, 90% is still extremely high, so it is still very unlikely that we would be wrong in that case anyway. Maybe, I don't know, every one out of 10. Cool? So at this point, let's go ahead and look at another question. But in this case, I want to go ahead and show you guys how to do this a little bit quicker by using the calculator. 
So a little outdated, I know, but here it says that over the weekend, you watched Joey Votto take batting practice for the Cincinnati Reds. He swung at 2,000 pitches, but only hit 750 of them. It asks, what is the proportion of balls that he hit as a percent? And then the second part of this actually asks us to create a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of balls that Joey Votto will hit on any given day. So when we are looking at this, the first question, P hat, how do you find your probability of success? It doesn't actually give us P hat in this situation. Instead, it gives us 2,750, which is our N, our total number in our sample, and X, which in this case, X is our total number of successes. And how do you find P hat? Well, that's easy. It's just your number of successes divided by your total number of attempts. So in this case, it'd be our 750 divided by 2,000. And if we were to go about the long way of plugging this into our calculator, we would find out that that gives us 0.375, but it does ask it for it as a percent. So we would put that there is, no, well, in this case, he hit 37.5% of those balls. All right. Now, in order to create a confidence interval, we actually will do this on the calculator and it will even give us the P hat as well. I just wanted to show you guys how to do it because it's been a while since we've had X and N given to us instead of just given to us flat as a P hat. So I want to make sure we remember what that was. Um, but our calculator is going to give us the upper and lower bound of our confidence interval. It's going to give us P hat and it's also going to give us our margin of error, all just by plugging in these simple numbers that it gave us in this question. So let's go ahead and take a look, see at that in the calculator. In order to do confidence intervals in the calculator, you will go to your menu. We are now to the point where we will be going to six for statistics, and we're going to go down to confidence intervals, which is what we're doing. Now, there are a ton of confidence intervals in here. We are actually going to end up doing all of them from one through six. But for right now, we've been learning one proportion the interval. So I'm going to go ahead and hit one proportion the interval. It asks for two things, X and N, and then it already has filled in a C level. We'll talk about that in a second. So in this case, what was our X? X is our number of successes, and there were 750 of them. What was N? N is the total number of attempts, which there were 2,000 of them. And our confidence level was 95. Now, you can type in here and change this to like 90, but in this case, we are just keeping it at 95 because that's what it asked for. And you hit enter and it gives us a slew of wonderful information. Starting off, it gives us that the lower bounder of our confidence interval is going to be 0.353783. In other words, about a 35%. The upper bound is going to be a 39.62%. All right. And then it gives us, like I said, the P hat and the margin of error. So if we wanted to actually write out the confidence interval, that means it'd be 0.375 plus 0.021217 and 0.375 minus 0.021217, which is where these two answers up here come from. So it gives you all the stuff we need. So let's go ahead and bring that back to our question and fill out the rest of this. I went ahead just to make things a little bit easier. I copy and pasted that already on here just so that we can go ahead and write our final answer out and finish this. So we would say that with a 95% confidence interval, we would expect Joey Votto on any given day to hit between 35.38% to, let's see, how about 39.62. So on any given day, we would expect him to hit somewhere between 35 and almost 40% of the balls that were pitched to him. And we would be able to say that with 95% confidence. So obviously, the calculator makes this a lot shorter. You don't have to go through calculating your standard error. You don't have to find your critical value. You don't have to go about finding your margin of error by hand with the multiplication. You don't have to do the adding and subtracting it from your P hat. It does all of that for you. So we're actually going to end here today. Thanks for joining me. I hope you got something out of the video. Remember, if you need to catch up on any of the other videos I've created, you can always find my work on YouTube at Mr. Caproni. So as always, guys, stay fit, stay healthy, 
and have a wonderful week.